Thank you for the introduction, Chairman. Um, so my name is David Mazzucchi. Um, together with the project manager of QB50, today we decided to change a little bit the uh, title of the presentation, as you can see here in, uh, on the slide. So we, we're not going to only focus on the status of QB50, but what I want to, uh, the message that I want to give to you is that we are proceeding with the science of QB50, and here I want to give you some of the uh, news and the status of the, of the science and where we are and where we want to go. So, <clears throat> as an introduction, I want to give you briefly uh, which are the objectives of QB50, the activities that are going on right now, the status of the project, then I'm going to talk about the scientific objectives of the study, the methodology, uh, namely the sensor units and uh, the code that we're going to use to make simulation to compare with the flight data, some results, and that's the conclusions and the near future. So, <clears throat> here are the objectives of QB50. We have four main objectives in, in the project. Uh, the first is indeed facilitating the access to space, so we're going to provide an achievable, uh, sustainable and affordable access to space for small satellites, uh, especially when we talk about uh, small-scale research space mission and or planetary uh, exploration, as QB50 is. The second part is indeed the science, the scientific aspect of the mission. So what we want to achieve is to investigate the lower atmosphere characteristics in this case. I'm going to go through these objects, uh, in objectives in more detail uh, in a later slide. Then um, <clears throat> what, what we want to do, what we want to achieve is to actually make some orbit demonstration. So we, we have QB50 is an excellent platform for technology demonstration. As a, it would be formation flights from QDEL, for example, ablation studies from BKI, you have seen the presentation yesterday, and uh, for example, inflatable state structures. And last but not the least, educate uh, future engineers uh, to build uh, more reliable satellites. And in my opinion, judging from uh, the presentation we had and the beautiful words of the speaker, uh, we are doing a good job there. So, what, what is the main activities of the QB50 so far? So, what we, um, to achieve the objectives that we pose ourselves, we're going to send into orbit, into LEO orbit, 50 double CubeSats, roughly, would be, um, say, a blend of double and triple CubeSats, actually, that will be launched in January 2016. Um, the intention of QB50 is to carry out unprecedented science campaigns probing the thermosphere, the lower thermosphere, with the fragmented sensors, uh, around 40, I will go through this also in the slide, demonstrate CubeSat technology, which is the status of the technology right now. The main mission of the QB50 consortium is to support the teams to make more reliable CubeSats uh, through uh, a very thorough uh, um, review, technical review of their CubeSats. Then to provision them with ADCS, uh, with sensor units, so with the hardware, but as I said, with the help into the guidance, guidance to the design. <clears throat> and then, as we already have seen, we already performed successful precursor flight in June 2014. Some little thing to tweak here and there, but we are on the way. So here, this is the status of QB50 so far. So we completed CDR mainly for all the consortium technologies. The Quapex are flown, actually. Uh, INMX is flown, FIPEX is flown. We shall get some results in the near future. Langer Pro, the CDR is closed. Uh, we are actually uh, going to build the, the, um, uh, the hardware very soon for the INMX. All the units are ready. All, 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 uh, everything is already integrated, fully integrated. The ground segment is something that we are consolidating right now with all the teams. Um, <clears throat> there, as I said, some issues here and there, but as, as you can expect from a large mission as QB50. So, um, what, um, from the QSA point of view, we are, CDR is completed. Again, uh, some uh, teams were really fast in completing CDR. Some of the teams were a bit behind, so we are giving more help to those teams to complete their CDR successfully. And um, again, uh, regarding the ADCS, you have seen, we have 
some issues to close, but the ADCS units are ready uh, to be shipped to the teams also. So you see a picture on the bottom right of all the ADCS units. Um, and now frequency coordination uh, for all the CubeSats has started, and some of you may have already have received by their authorities uh, the facts from the IDU. So quickly again, uh, the status and a management point of view, so central server API has been settled. We are about to uh, distribute sensor units to the teams. The launcher has been consolidated. Uh, now I'm going to talk through uh, the measurement and the thermospheric uh, thermosphere analysis. We're going to perform, so here a bit of, uh, let's say, details on the, detail, the VTI um, team, and then, well, we perform a successful precursor campaign. So, what is the main, which are the main objectives of QB50? So, we are going to perform multi-point fragmentated measurements of the equator and the poles. Now, we are going to measure with an unprecedented spatial and temporal resolution the anomalies that you have in the thermosphere. For example, just to name some, uh, the aurora particle heating, equatorial anomalies, and the equatorial electrojet. So what we're going to do is, what we're going to achieve is to compare. We'll be able to compare and cross-correlate similar or complementary flight data with other space uh, say mission, for example, validate and enhance the physical models in the upper atmosphere. And then um, the, how are we going to do that? We, we are able to tune the CONOPS together with the community and with the teams to be able to measure also tra transitory anomalies in the atmosphere. So <clears throat> here, just a graph to show you um, some of the feature that we, we have. So this is a profile. These are profiles of all the species and neutrals and ions. Uh, different altitudes, so we have a density of those species, and here you have the three sensor units. And my point that will stop working. Yeah, but there is a, that. So we have the three units there. Uh, so the three units are measuring different things. So we have a ion and neutron mass spectrometer that is measuring basically atomic oxygen, molecular oxygen, and no and two and the ions of those species. And here you see actually the sensitivity uh, range of this sensor. Moreover, we're going to measure with the feedbacks, so atomics, atomic and molecular oxygen. Again, you see where we are, so you can clearly compare the profiles of the species at different altitudes and where we're going to measure them. So we're going to measure them, so the sensitivity of each sensor. And again, for the Langley probe, we're going to measure electron density, and therefore we're going to infer also the electron temperature out of the sensor. So, uh, which is the methodology we are going to use? This is a courtesy of Dr. Uh, Aaron Ridley, I believe he's in the public, I don't see him. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ridley actually uh, gave us the possibility to use his global ionospheric thermosphere model, GITAM, uh, in the acronym. So, GITAM is a, it's a excellent solver uh, that we are trying to use right now to predict and validate the flight data. <coughs> future flight data in this case. So GITAM, quickly, uh, just to give some of the things, it's a full, fully physical solver, so it's not anything, it's not empirical at all, as we have, for example, the IRI or the MSIS model, which is a fully physical model. Uh, here, just a bit of, uh, of the features of, um, of GITAM. So what GITAM is different from all the other codes, it's, it, has, it solves, um, actually, uh, the equations of continuity, uh, energy, and, and momentum in altitude coordinates, which is totally different from what the other codes are doing. So it's imposing not hydrostatic solution, so it's not uh, actually um, solving by pressure, okay? So because of the, the altitude, we increase the pressure, what we decrease the pressure. So using non hydrostatic solution allows GITAM to use coronary effects, uh, vertical line drag, non quantum gravity, which is something uh, it's innovative in this case, and also impose uh, auroral heating into the model. So again, uh, the model can run 1D, 3D, uh, it has a lot of features, it solves um, the chemistry explicitly, which is a really nice thing, and then has flexible grid, and that's just something we, uh, that we love actually. So <clears throat> how are we gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do the study? So what we, um, as a first step, we try to validate the code for our purposes. So we choose actually three different cases, in, uh, you see here in the picture, so we chose 
chat data, so it's a challenging minus, uh, minus satellite payload that is very known for being a uh, very successful mission. And actually, CHAMP was measuring uh, density at, at uh, an altitude of 400 kilometers, or more or less. Then we have the time data, which is the thermosphere and sphere uh, satellite that is measuring with the SABER and the TD um, instruments is measuring atomic oxygen. And then we have also the ASCAT uh, in this case, which is a, basically it's a ionospheric radar. So it's, it's in Tromso in Norway, and it's measuring electron density. Unfortunately, for this one, I don't have permission to show data, so, um, okay, so I won't show them. Um, <clears throat> the idea that was behind choosing those things, uh, those type of measurements, um, I have to say, because uh, uh, the, the reasoning behind was to choose something that was measuring exactly the same kind of pieces and characteristics that we're going to measure with the sensor of the QB50. So I have to admit that it wasn't easy to find uh, other satellites to compare. Um, not, not always all the data are publicly available. And uh, we believe that QB50 will be a terrible breakthrough in this. We're going to basically give a lot of new scientific data to the community to compare when we will have the flight. So I think this is it's a wonderful experience and a possibility for the scientists. So here I'm just going through some of the results we obtained. So we're gonna, uh, you know, we, we have to first learn how to use the code efficiently to get uh, good results. So here we did a, a grid sensitivity analysis. So we tried to change uh, the grid spacing, the discretization in the code. <clears throat> so in the black line you see uh, chan data, measurement data. Uh, on the yellow line you see the AMSYS uh, uh, simulations. Uh, you have to see that AMSYS, uh, AMSYS computations are really close to CHAM, and uh, that's as easily explainable. So AMSYS is an empirical code, so basically it's interpolating data from EQA, from ionospheric uh, radars, and also from CHAM. So it's, luckily it's just comparing fine. Uh, the other three uh, <coughs> graphs you see, uh, the blue, the red, and the green, are indeed GITAM computation. So, as I mentioned before, GITAM is fully physical, so there is no empirical correlation in there. It's just doing, uh, giving the data, giving the results because of physics. Okay, so there is nothing behind. So more than the physics in it. So, <coughs> as you can see here, this is uh, just a little bit of a grid study. So we're trying you know, to learn how to set up the grid in a, in a, in a better way. <clears throat> what we understood is that GITA, this is the relative error, so between GITA computation and the chat data, so we have seen that the relative errors can go from 100 to 200 percent. This is one of the, um, say, limitations of GITA that we, we, we are aware. Uh, what's, what can be shown is that larger grid spacing gives a generally decreasing of the error, mostly because of uh, of, um, of the gradient smoothing. So what we try to do is like we try to change a bit of the parameters, uh, the input boundary uh, conditions to GitHub code. Yeah, that's good. Um, so what we did is we changed, for example, the photoelectron efficiency. So we know uh, the photoelectron efficiency cannot be directly measured. It's difficult to measure. Um, so we try to change. Uh, this photoelectron efficiency to compare with it with the chat data, and we see that indeed it has an effect. So, <clears throat> uh, here we also compare uh, escape one slide. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through with you at the copy if you wish. Um, so, we try to compare again data with time data, in this case, atomic oxygen measurements. Here, uh, we want to highlight the fact that simulated atomic oxygen by GITA are within 25% with the measurement data by time satellite, which is pretty good, I would say. Uh, the simulation seems catching uh, the general plan, so the valley and peaks, but we, have a, we tend to have a phase shift. Here we are investigating what, where, where is coming this phase shift, but I'm pretty sure we are, we are solve this problem. So uh, to conclude and give, a, give you a near future um, perspective, so we did an investigation and we, we carried on investigation on how to correctly assess the boundary conditions uh, on the GITAM code, uh, especially for discretization. Uh, we, we compare different flight data mm, with GITAM to, to assess the strength of the code, and that's, it's really important for, for us. Then what we 
to, to, we do all this because we want to use data not only to compare with flight data, with the precursor, for example, we will have data very soon, but because we want to use the GitHub code to, as a predicting tool. So we want to predict the anomalies of the atmosphere and then tune the conox of QB50 to be able to measure that anomaly when, for example, solar flares or so forth, and measure that thing. Then, interestingly enough, we're going to perform UQ, so uncertainty quantification on the code. We're going to see how much the code is behaving, which are the key parameters to play with, and how much uh, is uh, trying to establish an uncertainty on the results of the simulation. And um, last, but again not least, we are trying to investigate uh, the measurement uncertainty of the sensor units, QB50 sensor units, cross-correlating the results between them, uh, not only between them, bet between, uh, that's one of the strength of the QB50, we are sending the same sensor 15 times in orbit. So we're going to be able to compare the same sensor with the different uh, satellites or between other sensors and try to cross-correlate the data and establish uncertainty. So, um, I want to thank uh, all of you, all the teams participating in QB50. Without you, uh, this project won't be possible at all. I want to thank um, QB50 Consortium and not the least uh, the European Commission for founding this beautiful project. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, do we have any questions? See, while we're, while we're waiting for the microphone, I have a question, or maybe it's a comment, I guess. You talked about using the, the ice scatter, coherent scatter system. I um, also wanted to point out that the National Science Foundation in the United States supports a, a network of incoherent scatter radar systems, including Millstone Hill at the mid-latitude, Sea Comarca and Arecibo at the, the um, equatorial latitudes, and then Poker Flat and the, the uh, advanced incoherent uh, modular incoherent scatter radar systems in the Arctic. And they do uh, coordination and planning uh, about a year, year and a half in advance. So I think as we get closer to launch, it would be good to engage that community and maybe even look at a, a um, campaign to, um, with some ground-based systems to support data for the mission. It would be very nice to have all that data. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, for the, thanks for the comment. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, is the Madrigal uh, actually uh, community. I'm aware of that, uh, but you know, for the purpose of the validation, we just select one, and it's not easy to find uh, good data to compare, that's, I have to say, uh, not always the radar is on, and that's a bad part, and then when it comes to satellites, not always the satellite is working, and the, base, the measurements are corrupt, and to, co to find continuous measurement for, let's say, one day to compare with, it's not an easy task, I have but thanks for your comment, yes. Sure. Really one, of the, one of the challenges of experimentalists trying to make everything work at the same yeah, time. Yeah, correct. So, uh, uh, out here? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, in your presentation, you have mentioned that uh, some countries start frequency coordination activities. Uh, what exactly uh, has been done up to now in this field? Could you please clarify? Yeah, correct. Oh, so, all the, all the QB50 uh, teams have submitted to us a young form for the coordination of the frequencies. So we have AMSA, which is helping us with the, co with the coordination. So all the frequencies allocation have been passed to ITU, and ITU now uh, is actually sending to all the national um, responsible faxes with the request for coordinating the, sensor with the, the frequency allocation. So it's an ongoing process right now. I think there was another question over here. Uh, I have a bit of a, I guess, more practical question of um, the time stamping of the data. I, I guess I'm assuming you're probably using something related or using GPS to some extent. Is that accurate enough for all 50 um, like for time stamps? I guess it's not all 50 at once, but or is there other uh, are there other methods you guys are incorporating to get a more accurate time stamp? Okay, so um, we are reviewing all the technical. Uh, design of the CubeSets and GPS, it's uh, what we impose to the teams to be used because of the precision. Um, so if we were not able to track correctly the satellite in position, then these data won't be useful for us. So indeed, GPS is the solution. Okay, are there any additional questions? I, I 
I have one. Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the challenges of QB50 is that the satellites are at, like, flying at low altitude. Uh, the atmospheric drag is significant and the atmosphere is very sensitive to solar activity. And in this regard, there is a very good example of Goche that collected data at these altitudes. Is there any plan also to analyze the data of Goche? I don't even know if, it's, if you have access to the data, but uh, did, did you consider that option? Um, for sure, the, we already, I already made contact with ESA, uh, Educational Office, and the data is the website for sharing the, the data of uh, all the satellites, Swarm, for example, Goche, and other satellites. Uh, this is something we still have to assess in details. Uh, it's easy to get access to the website, it's not easy to get good data. And uh, that will require a bit of time. And that's why we start already right now to, to look into that, to deal into that problem. But thanks for your comment. Great. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks a lot.